from the Mercy One Studio. Support for Faith on Trial and Iowa Catholic Radio provided in part by Imogene Ingredients. Our freedom of conscience and religion is being challenged by laws and regulations imposed by secular society. It's time to hear from the top Christian litigators in the nation who have come forward to tell us the truth and help us defend our faith. Hear ye, hear ye. All rise. Faith on Trial with Defender of the Faith, Deacon Mike Mano is in session. And good Thursday morning from the Mercy One Studios in West Des Moines, and happy Feast of the Annunciation. Gina, how are you this morning? I am well. I am well. So the Feast of the Annunciation, right in the middle of the Easter season. That, well, the, or Lenten, the season. Lenten season. Right, but you know what's well, set there? It's nine months to the day to Christmas. Ah, that makes sense. That does make sense. And, and Biologically correct. And, and there's, there's, there's another reason, too. Um, since... Christ was manifested to Mary on this day because she said yes, right? Exactly. So the Holy Spirit came upon her. Uh, There was an old belief among the ancients that um, men who, great men, began their life and died on the same day. And so the 25th of March coincides with the original Good Friday. No kidding. Yeah. Well... That's a very interesting historical fact, yeah. which I count on you for this great information. And, and I'm going from memory here. I, If I would have thought about it yesterday, I would have dug out the information so that I could get it square for you. But yeah, that's... Isn't it interesting how God's great planet, everything falls into place in this puzzle that we call life. That's right. And if it was, it was on a Friday, you could eat meat. Oh, because it, it, would, it would have been like a like, uh, solemnity, right, yeah. Very good. So... Uh, We'll make sure you fun keep up on those things. Yes, yes, right. <laughs> How to write a book on that. Yeah, fun facts for Catholics. I um, it. Th- are you ready for Palm Sunday? Are you getting ready for the uh, holiest week of the year? I'm going to show up at my scheduled times at St. Augustine and do what they tell me to do. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I think, uh, you know, we have a, a, a gospel at the beginning and a gospel during the Mass. Right. So I'm getting ready for those. I have... I believe, two Masses this weekend, besides whatever I'm going to do at St. Anthony's. But no processions, I imagine. I don't know. Well, I don't know. I do I, miss like the I say, pageantry. I'm, I'm going Sunday. to show up. And uh, now they've loosened some of the regulations a little bit here, so I think maybe we will have a procession. So we'll see. Well, we'll I, see. Hope so, I hope so. I hope so, too. I think it's important for the all of the senses to be involved in the, in the, the one, celebration. The one that I hope we don't miss is the one after the Mass on Holy Thursday, the procession to take the Eucharist to the altar of repose. To me, that's a very meaningful Do, Does that procession. involve the entire congregation? I no, don't it, it's, no just the, it's just um, the people on the altar, right. Mm-hmm. And uh, we take the uh, Eucharist to the altar of repose, really symbolizing Christ leaving the Last Supper and going to the desert or right. going to the Garden of Olives. Yeah, and uh, and that to me is uh, is kind of the highlight of these days up until the uh, uh, Easter Vigil. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Well, the services will be wonderful. I hope so, because uh, we missed them last year. That's right. Yeah, we missed them last so year. They'll so they'll mean a lot more. I hope they will. I, uh, Iowa is in the news nationally, and we're going to get to talk about that today. Yeah. Some the, very um, interesting court cases that the, protect our uh, First Amendment. Business leaders in Christ, and we've talked about this before, this uh, case from Iowa City, uh, where the uh, university... Uh, deplatformed or <laughs> removed a, a, a group from the roster of uh, approved student groups, and they finally got their day in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, which uh, excoriated the university. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. I'm um, anxious to, we, we talked to a state legislator. Today. Yes, we did. We did. We talked to uh, Senator Amy Sinclair yesterday. We taped that interview and we'll be playing it a little bit later. And uh, it's interesting that some of the things that we've been talking about here 
are some of the reasons why she moved the way she did on some legislation that will protect now individual free speech rights and religious rights on state campuses. For our students yes. and for and for the faculty and, faculty mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. staff and staff and everybody else. Every yeah. American citizen that is involved in universities. Right. And so we've got, got a similar uh, or a guest with a similar uh, topic uh, first. And uh, that's uh, Chris Sandoval from the Alliance Defending Freedom. And he's been involved in some of these cases on a national level. And he's involved in one now from, uh, I think it's from Al, uh, Arkansas, going to the Supreme Court on one of the issues that was decided in the A Circuit case involving business leaders in Christ, which is, are the university officials who make these rules and these decisions that clearly violate a person's free speech and religious uh, convictions, uh, are they personally liable for damages? Right, and the Eighth and Circuit. The Eighth Circuit said, "You betcha, I'm they are." Yeah. Really anxious to hear how that um, has progressed and what this means moving forward for all students. Well, earlier, and I, I should note this earlier: this the Eighth Circuit had come out kind of uh, equivocal on that. You know, yes, no, maybe, uh, but this one is pretty definite. Well, this then, is pretty definite. So we'll find so. out. We uh, we talk to these folks. Um, go ahead. You were going to say no, something. I think I was just going to say, let's begin with a prayer. I was and just going to say the same thing. We're thinking on the same lines here. We've been together too long, I guess, doing this. All right, go ahead. Um, A prayer for peace today. Uh, In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God of peace, bring your peace to our violent world. Peace in the hearts of all men and women, and peace among the nations of this earth. Turn to your way of love those whose hearts and minds are consumed with hatred. Strengthen us in hope, and give us the wisdom and courage to work tirelessly for a world where true peace and love reign among nations and in the hearts of all. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gina. And uh, we'll be right back after these messages. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and John Leonetti in the Morning is provided by Blessman International. Blessman International partners with volunteers and donors to provide sustainable programs for children in South Africa by leading a 12-day, all-inclusive experience sharing the heart of Christ with vulnerable children in South Africa. Teams are forming to do something significant in an African child's life. Learn more at blessmaninternational.org. That's blessmaninternational.org. Thank you, Blessman International, for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and John Lee and Eddie in the Morning provided by Bell Construction. Bell Construction is a roofing company. They specialize in residential re-roofs, like commercial jobs, and have the experience to meet all of your roofing needs with personal service. With Bell Construction, the owner will come to your home or place of business in person to inspect and ensure the quality of work that you deserve. They pride themselves in working with you on a personal basis and making sure you are satisfied. Bell Construction, 515-963-4494. Bell Construction. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Dowling Catholic Sports is provided in part by Ashworth Vision Clinic. With two licensed optometrists, Barbara Sheets, a Dowling graduate, and Dr. Craig Harper, the Ashworth Vision Clinic team provides complete eye exams, contact lenses, glasses, glaucoma testing, and pre- and post-operative care. Ashworth Vision Clinic is located at 60th and Ashworth in West Des Moines. 515-440-4610 or online ashworthvision.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Catholic Women Now provided in part by Permar Security, providing security solutions for homes and businesses since 1953. Permar Security is a Catholic-owned family business supplying security systems, access control systems, video surveillance, fire alarm systems, and video doorbells. All alarm systems are monitored out of their monitoring center located in the state of Iowa. Permar Security, 515-244-5660, permarsecurity.com. Thank you, Dental Associates, for underwriting Dowling Catholic Sports 365. With over 40 years' experience, Dental Associates is a group dental practice with the mission of promoting optimum health and well-being to all patients, providing preventative, restorative, and cosmetic dentistry for the entire family. Message underwritten by Dr. Kenton Gleichman, Dr. Steve Carbaca, and Dr. Ben Nagel. Dental Associates, addressing your smile, needs, and dreams. Online at Des Moines-DentalAssociates.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Faith on Trial provided by Paul Martin and Paul Mitchell, owners of Imogene Ingredients. Imogene Ingredients supply specialized feed ingredients for livestock and pet diets to improve maternal and young animal health in both conventional and organic production. 
And welcome back. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Island Catholic Radio. And with us right now from the Alliance Spending Freedom is uh, Chris Sandoval. Chris, how are you this morning? Good morning, Deacon. I'm doing well. Doing well. Thank you very much. We're happy to have you here. I um, want to talk to you about a couple of these uh, free speech uh, campus free speech cases that are going up to the Supreme Court or have been up to the Supreme Court. Had a big one, uh, and I, if, I hope on I'm pronouncing this right, Azabunum, is that the name? We, we've been pronouncing it Uzabunum. Uzabunum, okay. Uzabunum, okay. Um, that one uh, upheld the right of a student to, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, proselytize on college campus is the way I read it. It, it did. So so what the case there really is all about, uh, the legal question in, in that case is really about the value of constitutional freedoms, uh, including the the right to free speech and, and the right to, as, as Chike was doing, the right to share his faith. Um, and what we've been saying all along and, and told the Supreme Court, of course, is that those rights are priceless and that courts should treat them like they are. Uh, unfortunately, the lower court in that case had, had essentially said that that right uh, was worthless and didn't even entitle him uh, to his day in court. So fortunately, the Supreme Court, in an 8-1 decision, uh, reversed that lower court decision and said, absolutely, those rights are priceless, and his, his lawsuit is allowed to proceed in the lower courts. And when we talk about priceless, um, we're also talking here in a couple of these cases about whether or not college officials can be held personally liable for um, denying First Amendment rights to students. We are so that, and that kind of gets us to our second case that uh, that I'd like to chat about with you today, which is the the Ashland Hogger case. Uh, that is a case uh, involving a a legal doctrine uh, that courts call qualified immunity. Right, uh, and basically what that is, it's, it's a defense that government officials use uh, to avoid accountability when they violate people's constitutional rights. So similar to what happened in Chike's case, uh, in Ashland's case, she's a student at Arkansas State University. Uh, those school officials were able to uh, avoid accountability and get, get Al- Ashland's lawsuit dismissed by claiming what, what they call qualified immunity. All right. Now, as I understand the case, she had was had filed suit against the officials themselves, correct? She did. She so had already lawsuit. already won on on the free speech claim. Well, so he, so here's what happened in Ashland's case. So Ashland was a um, like I said, a student at Arkansas State. Uh, all she wanted to do was set up a table to recruit uh, students to join a conservative student group that she was starting on campus. Uh, and when Arkansas State officials uh, found out that she had a table set up, they called campus police. Uh, police came, confronted her, officials confronted her, and told her that uh, she was not allowed to speak there uh, because she hadn't followed the speech policies the school had because she hadn't gotten advanced permission, she wasn't in the right place to do it, et cetera. Um, and so when she, uh, along with Alliance Defending Freedom, when we filed a lawsuit on her behalf, um, that lawsuit Um, prompted the state of Arkansas to pass a statute called the Forum Act. Uh, And the Forum Act basically tells state universities, you have to follow the First Amendment. Uh, You shouldn't need a statute to tell public officials they have Mm. to follow the First Amendment. Uh, But fortunately, when Arkansas had passed that statute, then the school said, okay, well, now we have to repeal our bad speech policies. Um, But once they did that, then they came into court and argued, well, you know, since we've repealed our policies, you should really dismiss this case. Uh, because we have this qualified immunity defense, which shields us from any liability for the constitutional harm for violating Ashland's uh, First Amendment rights, and that's what the that's what the district court said. The district court said, uh, you know, I agree, qualified immunity applies, and 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 that judge didn't even decide whether there was a constitutional violation. He just said, I'm not even going to decide that. I hold they're entitled to qualified immunity. I dismiss the case. We appealed to the Eighth Circuit. Uh, the Eighth Circuit agreed with us that there was a First Amendment violation, uh, that you can't just kick a student speaker, you know, off of uh, campus when they're trying to speak and say, you can't speak here. Um, but unfortunately, the Eighth, the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals said, um, you know, we do, though, agree with the trial court that qualified immunity applies. In other words, that um, it's conceivably possible that maybe the school officials just didn't know any better uh, when they told her she wasn't allowed to speak on campus, and therefore we're gonna we're gonna say the lawsuit should be dismissed. 
Uh, so we're appealing that ruling up to the Supreme Court. Well, now the Eighth Circuit just ruled in a case from Iowa, uh, just the other way around, that the the uh, officials could be held. That's the uh, uh, business leaders in Christ case. I saw that they did, and then obviously we're we're grateful uh, for that ruling. Uh, unfortunately, you know, even a court uh, like the Eighth Circuit that that typically does a good job of affirming constitutional rights. Uh, the way that qualified immunity works, the way that, that defense works, is it allows government officials to say that, you know, okay, even if what we did here was unconstitutional, unless you can show us a case where another court has said this exact same policy is unconstitutional, uh, then, you know, we, sh- we should get the case dismissed because maybe we, we couldn't have known any better. Um, you know, we, we were, you know, doing our best and we just got this one wrong, so aw, aw shucks. Um, we'll try harder next time. And unfortunately, the way that the Supreme Court in recent cases has applied that defense, that doctrine, uh, it does allow lower courts to dismiss those cases uh, and and allow government officials uh, to avoid accountability. Um, it's basically a defense that says, you know, even if we should know better by now, I mean, courts across the country have been uh, striking down unconstitutional speech policies like Arkansas State's. Um, but what the school officials said there was, you know, that may be happening in other states and other courts, um, but no one has told us yet that we're not allowed to have our policy. And until a court tells us that our policy is unconstitutional, uh, we're going we're gonna to keep on enforcing it to violate our students' free speech rights. And what qualified immunity says currently in its current form is, yes, that, that's okay. They get, they get that free pass as long as no court has ruled on the exact same set of facts yet. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, well, Gina. I'm more interested in the um, the consequences of this behavior. Uh, so you mentioned that Arkansas uh, has legislated um, protections for the students, and we're going to talk to an Iowa legislator that they're in the process of also putting some teeth to it and providing some consequences for the um, administrators or professors that engage in this activity of violating the students' rights. Um, is that the route to go? And does Arkansas have any consequences put in their legislation? Oh, so I haven't I haven't reviewed Arkansas's specific statute recently to be able to answer that question well. But we're kind of starting um, at, at a place that's even even before even before that. So uh, we're very grateful that Arkansas and Iowa have passed you know this this very excellent um, First Amendment affirming statute. It's called the Forum Act. Unfortunately, you know, most states in, in, in the country have not passed any, any such legislation. Um, so throughout most of the country, you still have this problem of schools violating their students' constitutional rights and then government officials not being held accountable for it. And really what we're hoping to do with Ashland's case uh, in the United States Supreme Court, you know, obviously this was a problem uh, for Ashland in her specific case. And obviously the way qualified immunity works to, to allow uh, government officials to escape liability is a problem for her, uh, but it's a much uh, broader problem because it allows all sorts of government officials, uh, whether it be schools, universities, you know, county, local officials, um, to violate you know, free speech rights, uh, religious freedom rights, Fourth Amendment rights, Eighth Amendment rights, you know, every sort of constitutional right uh, you can imagine. Right. And then to come into court and, and say, well, no court has told us we couldn't, and therefore, you should dismiss this case and not hold it, not not allow there to be any consequences for our actions. Now, we're not we're not asking for we're not asking obviously for you know millions of dollars of damages uh, for this violation. Uh, just like uh, Chike, you know, oftentimes the, the dollar amounts are really um, because constitutional rights are priceless. You know, it's not about money; it, it's about courts affirming. Uh, that the Constitution means something, these constitutional rights mean something, and that these individuals, and when their rights are violated, should have their day in court and be able to prove that and hold these officials accountable. Now, I uh, saw the petition, your petition for certiorari, and there's a lot of talk about something that uh, maybe a lot of our listeners don't know what it is, which is dicta. And uh, why don't you explain what dicta is and how that figures into the... Uh, uh, composition okay. of this case. Maybe we should start with what's a petition for Sir Cesare. Oh, so sorry. That, that that's the request for the court to hear the case. Ah, I got right. it. All right. That hasn't been granted yet, okay. my understanding. But and uh, then so the dicta. Yes. Right. Thank you. Right. Right. So 
so what we're hoping to do with this petition uh, is to ask the Supreme Court um, to really clarify uh, the way that qualified immunity should work and really rein in some of the worst abuses. Um, so one example where that we think the court can do that with this particular case is, is just like you mentioned, it has to do with this concept of dicta. Uh, so when a court writes an, writes an opinion, uh, I mean, at the very end of the opinion, you can see what the outcome is. You know, this side wins, this side loses, uh, and here's the legal holding. You know, this constitutional right was violated or, or was not violated. That's, that's called the holding. Now, in order to get to that holding, uh, the courts do a lot of work explaining the reasons for that holding. Um, and so, along the way, you know, some of that reasoning um, can be classified as something called dicta, which is, you know, maybe something a court might say along the way to explain its ruling, but it's not really necessary to the ultimate outcome. Um, so you can, you can understand why, you know, the court kind of goes off and gets sidetracked and talks about something completely irrelevant to the case, uh, that maybe that's dicta and not something that, you know, government officials should be required, uh, you know, should need to know about. Um, but unfortunately, what's happening is, you know, several courts have said for qualified immunity purposes, for giving a defense to these government officials, um, all the government officials, all we really expect them to know is that bottom line, who won, who lost. They don't have to worry about reading the rest of the opinion. They don't have to worry about understanding, you know, the way the Constitution works as the courts have explained it. Um, as long as the government won, uh, then government officials can continue to violate their students' rights. Um, and use qualified immunity as a defense. Uh, that's essentially what happened in Ashland's case, where the court said, listen, you've got this prior case where the government won, uh, and because of that, we think the government might have thought that it could win here too, uh, even though that case was a completely different set of facts, and even though the reasoning, the legal reasoning in that case explains why what the school officials did here with their speech policies was unconstitutional and should have given them fair warning that they needed to change their policies long before the state had to pass a statute to force them to. Okay, so what um, what the court, I guess, is saying is understand everything that we've been saying, uh, which means that uh, here are certain rights that the students have. But in this case, it was different because of whatever. But these are still the rights. And what the government officials have been saying is they'll take – the decision that says they could do it for whatever reason. You had, a say, a disruptive student that was removed from uh, the free speech zone or whatever. Um, that the particulars of a, of a case may uh, uh, require a different uh, decision than the plaintiff was wanting. Uh, the fact is that the court, in its opinion, did set out what the law is and is now ruling on an exception. That's right. And, and to make it even more concrete, using, using Ashland's case, um, in Ashland's case, what the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals was looking at was a prior decision um, that ruled in favor of the college officials enforcing speech policies. Uh, but in that case, what the court said in its reasoning was, listen, anytime you require anyone to get advanced permission to speak, uh, that carries with it a heavy presumption that that is unconstitutional. And so in this prior case, it was only because they were dealing with a non-student speaker who was coming onto campus and provoking violent crowds and violent reactions. Only in that narrow context did the court previously say that that speech policy enforced against him was okay. But to get to that conclusion, the court discussed these background legal principles that apply on college campuses that there's a presumption that you cannot require, um, especially your students, to get advanced permission before speaking. So what we want the Supreme Court to say is um, these government officials should be expected and not just to look at who won or who lost and then to go on their merry way violating a student's rights, but to, to read the entire opinion and to say, listen, we need to make sure we're protecting our students' rights. And that opinion should have given them plenty of warning that their policies, their blanket policies as, as applied to all students, were unconstitutional. Now, there is a split in the circuits, as I understand, on, on this issue. There is. And any time you're filing a petition uh, to the Supreme Court asking them to resolve a case, uh, they're much more likely to do that uh, if the lower courts are divided over the proper answer. Uh, so in this, in this case, you have four federal appellate courts um, that have said, yes, it's completely appropriate to expect government officials to understand the reasoning of prior cases and not just the outcome. 
Um, and that really follows from an, an older U- United States Supreme Court decision called Hope versus Pelzer, where the Supreme Court actually said that. Uh, unfortunately, in recent years, the court hasn't really applied that case much. And so now you have other courts, uh, at least a couple other courts that have said, no, we're not going to require government officials to know anything about the reasoning of an opinion. You know, all we care about is the result, who won, who lost. And the result of that, as occurred here, is that government officials are allowed off the hook. Okay. Now, that case is uh, your petition for certiorari was filed uh, just recently, as I recall. It was. It was filed about a month ago. Okay. And so we're coming up on the other side filing their brief in opposition here soon. Okay. And I imagine there'll be a lot of amici briefs uh, filed on both sides of this issue. Well, so we had six um, amici briefs filed on our side of the issue, uh, a diverse group of you know uh, free speech experts and advocates and students' rights advocates. Um, supporting our petition. Uh, oftentimes at this stage of the proceedings, you don't see a lot of amicus briefs on the other side, but we'll wait to see what happens. Uh, we do know that the university, though, is taking this petition very seriously. Um, they've hired uh, an attorney to represent them who was on um, President Biden's shortlist to be his solicitor general. Um, so they've gone and kind of called in the, uh, the, the, the big dogs uh, to defend what they did here um, and to defend what the lower court did here. So so we think that shows that they've realized that, you know, there's a real possibility the court is going to be interested in this case and, and take this case um, okay. to fix, to right one of the wrongs with qualified immunity. Okay, now the, the court has no time frame to which they have to reply to your request. Uh, in terms of giving us a, a ruling on whether or not to accept the appeal, the case. That's, that, that's correct. That's yeah. correct. Sometimes they'll rule on it the first time they look at the case, and other times they'll, they'll hold the case for several weeks. As okay. they consider it. Okay. And then once they uh, take the case, if they do take the case, um, then we start the process all over again with uh, new briefing. Uh, then you get a bunch of amici briefs filed. Uh, and then finally, hopefully, one of these days you get a hearing. That's right. So we would, we would expect to get a hearing in this case if the court does take the case um, sometime in the next term. Uh, either which, which starts in October of this year, uh, so sometime in the fall or winter, uh, we would expect to get that hearing. And then it would be maybe to the end of that term before you get a uh, a final reply, final answer. That's right. Court. But at the very latest, we would get an opinion by June of next year. Okay, so this is not an overnight project for you. <laughs> it, it, it's very much not, um, as as all of these cases go, and especially when you're dealing with. Um, students at colleges and universities. Uh, These cases take a long time to play out. Um, That's one of the the challenges in litigating these cases um, is that students graduate, you know, schools will play strategic games and change their policies and try to get them dismissed and then change their policies back after the fact. Um, So that's why it's so important that, you know, these cases are allowed to go forward, um, that the court isn't putting up roadblocks that prevent uh, students from holding uh, school officials accountable when they violate their rights. And that's why these two cases are so important. Now, if somebody who is listening knows of someone who may need your help, how do they get a hold of uh, Alliance Defending Freedom? Sure. You can go to our website uh, at adflegal.org. Um, you'll be able to find a link on there that will uh, tell you how to contact us. And, and um, obviously, we um, are always eager to defend constitutional rights. Um, and then also, if you just want to go there and learn more about the cases that we're involved in, ways that you can get involved and ways that you can be praying about our case, which, of course, is the most important thing you can be doing for us. That's a great place to do all of that as well. And, and of course, if you have some spare change you want to send their way, because everything ADF does is uh, pro bono to the to the this, client. This is true. The constitutional rights are priceless. We don't take uh, take any money from our clients. Um, so, of course, we obviously do appreciate and need that support. Um, from people like your listeners. Good. And, and now, anything you get off this radio program, remember, we get 10% back, right? For the... <laughs> okay, good to know. Good to know. That's right. Thank All you. right. Chris Sandoval, thank you very much for joining us today from the Alliance Fanny Freedom. We certainly appreciate uh, your time, and we appreciate what you are doing. Thanks so much, Deacon. Thanks, Gina. Great being here with you. Certainly. Thank you. And you're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio, and Gina and I will be back in just a few minutes.
Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Dowling Catholic Sports is provided in part by Ashworth Vision Clinic. With two licensed optometrists, Barbara Sheets, a Dowling graduate, and Dr. Craig Harper, the Ashworth Vision Clinic team provides complete eye exams, contact lenses, glasses, glaucoma testing, and pre- and post-operative care. Ashworth Vision Clinic is located at 60th and Ashworth in West Des Moines. 515-440-4610 515-440-4610 or online ashworthvision.com Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Catholic Women Now provided in part by Permar Security providing security solutions for homes and businesses since 1953 Permar Security is a Catholic owned family business supplying security systems access control systems video surveillance, fire alarm systems and video doorbells all alarm systems are monitored out of their monitoring center located in the state of Iowa. Permar Security, 515-244-5660, permarsecurity.com. Thank you, Dental Associates, for underwriting Dowling Catholic Sports 365. With over 40 years' experience, Dental Associates is a group dental practice with the mission of promoting optimum health and well-being to all patients, providing preventative, restorative, and cosmetic dentistry for the entire family. Message underwritten by Dr. Kenton Gleichman, Dr. Steve Carbaca, and Dr. Ben Nagel. Dental Associates, addressing your smile, needs, and dreams. Online at Des Moines-DentalAssociates.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and John Leonetti in the morning is provided by Five Sons Naturescapes. Five Sons Naturescapes is a Catholic veteran-owned family company providing premium outdoor landscaping. Clean up and restore outdoor living space with retaining walls, privacy fencing, pergolas, paver sidewalks, and patios. Issues with soil settling and water around the foundation and yard? Five Sons Naturescapes can grade and install drainage tile to help. Five Sons Naturescapes online at fivesonsnaturescapes.com. What is the best gift ever? Giving a Catholic education is at the top of my list. Your contribution to CTO helps families send their children to our Catholic schools who otherwise could not afford it. In giving to CTO, you receive the best tax credits ever. Pledge or donate online at ctoiowa.org. The bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Here's your forecast on Iowa Catholic Radio. Low pressure is moving up the Mississippi Valley, and that could bring us a few showers for the afternoon. Our high today will be around 50. Overnight, partly cloudy and mid to upper 30s, and then a little sunshine coming back tomorrow with some clouds. Our high in the upper 50s. Rain looks likely Friday night into Saturday. The weather is brought to you by Divine Treasures, a Catholic book and gift store serving the Des Moines community for over 25 years. I'm meteorologist Steve Hamilton on Iowa Catholic Radio. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio, and right now we have with us Senator Amy Sinclair, who is from Allerton, 14th Senatorial District. Uh, and we want to talk about some legislation on free speech on college campuses that is in the Iowa legislature right now. So, Senator, welcome to our program. Hey, thank you for having me. Certainly. Uh, just before we start on talking about the, uh, the bills here, uh, why don't you give us a little thumbnail version of who you are? Um, your name may not be familiar to some of our listeners. Sure, I'd be happy to. My name is Amy Sinclair, and I actually serve, as you said, the, the 14th district in the Iowa Senate. Um, I serve as the uh, as the Senate Majority Whip, um, and then I also serve as the chair of the Education Committee, and so um, do a lot of work related to to education policy. and uh, And and in particular, the bill we're going to talk about today has been has been a passion of mine. This this whole notion of of intellectual freedom and freedom of speech and assembly these are these are passions of mine that I've had, and so I've, I've worked pretty diligently to, to, to protect and defend those. Um, and so uh, th- this, this ties right in with who I am as a person. I, uh, I, as you said, I live down in Allerton, pretty rural, and I, I have three kids, um, Evan, Mitch, and Carter. Very good. Very good. Now, the bill we're talking about today is, um, I guess it's now House File 744. Is that correct? Yes. Um, we, we sent the, the Senate file to the House, and they divided the, the two major topics into um, one that deals with uh, your your um, mandatory trainings for for staff, and the other dealt specifically with just issues of free speech and and protections of First Amendment rights. And so the the protections of First Amendment rights, all of that information can be found in House File 744. Okay. Now 
just uh, can you give us a little uh, background on the, these two bills now and what they would actually do if passed and signed into law by Governor Reynolds? Sure, and let's let's run with House File 744 because that's kind of the, the, the topic that, that circles so closely with those First Amendment rights of, of uh, freedom of speech and expression and assembly. Um, mm-hmm. This past year has, I mean, it's been a trying year for everyone, everyone right? We've, we've, had, we've had a pandemic, we've had lockdowns, we've had people being separated from friends and families, and, and, and it's been a stressful year for everyone. Uh, but, I, but I think some things that are going on in the background that should stress us all, even as much as what's been going on that everybody sees, are some of these issues that we're seeing on our, our college campuses and in our K-12 schools. Um, three really high-profile uh, situations arose through the last year that has prompted this legislation. First of all, on the on the campus of the University of Northern Iowa, a, a the UNI Students for Life was denied was denied official um, campus uh, club status, if you will, by the student government. Now that decision was overturned by the by the university president. President Nook handled that well, but the fact that a student government thought that they could deny um, official organizational status to a group just because they, they didn't agree with their opinions, it, it should shock us all. Um, the second case was at, at Iowa State University where a professor actually put into her syllabus that certain conservative topics couldn't be discussed. Um, you can't write or talk about uh, uh, the right to life. You can't write or talk about, um, you know, support for, for uh, Second Amendment rights. You can't, you can't you can't express certain conservative ideals um, or you will be expelled from her class and her class happens to be a required course. So essentially you have to say what I want you to say or you can't get the credits you need to graduate from my classroom. Uh, and, and, and that's shocking. And again, I, um, President Winterstein responded well. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, those students, that syllabus was corrected. Those students were, were, not, were not discriminated against on that level. But it shouldn't have happened, just as at UNI, right. that shouldn't have happened. This shouldn't have happened either. And, and the third and maybe the final straw in the whole situation was at the, at the University of Iowa's College of Dentistry, where the administration of the College of Dentistry spoke out against a, an executive order that was, uh, that was enacted by President Trump related to, um, r- related to uh, uh, race and sex training um, and some divisive concepts there. There was an executive order issued that would have disallowed uh, any, any divisive concepts from being the sole uh, expression of, of trainings for, for um, race and sex. And, and uh, the, the administration spoke out against that, took a hard stand against that executive order. And a student, a student just responded in the email link that was sent out, but I kind of agree with it. This shouldn't be the only training that we get. And, and that student was scheduled for disciplinary action for speaking out against a, a political statement made by the administration of the College of Dentistry. These things shouldn't happen to, to students in Iowa. And so when these rise to the level of, of uh, gaining legislative attention, it's, it's kind of a big deal. Um, I will tell you that the Board of Regents has really stepped up to, to, the, to the plate here. They know it's wrong what, what happened on each, of their, on each of their campuses. They've created a, uh, a committee within the Board of Regents to, to deal with violations of, of students' First Amendment rights and staff's First Amendment rights, and they are working hard to, to address it. But I think we need to, to step up even further as a legislature and as a state and say this is a bigger issue than that, and we need to make sure that these situations aren't occurring in the first place and that students aren't being subjected to these, to these infringements upon their, their God-given and government-protected rights. Well, we've been following some of these cases. I know I've written about uh, at least uh, two of them here, uh, especially the one at UNI. I thought the president of uh, UNI did a marvelous job in how he mm-hmm. handled that. Uh, but uh, we see these going... Um, throughout the nation. Uh, so Iowa really doesn't appear to be unique in these uh, situations. They seem to be just kind of following along on some of the other things that we've seen in college campuses on other states. I, I would say that's accurate. I mean, the, the, uh, the recent Supreme Court decision related to the, to the college in, in Georgia um, that, that allowed for, for nominal financial damages to the students who were discriminated against, um, I, I think tells you that, that this is not isolated to Iowa. And that, and that colleges and universities are, in fact, violating students' rights. All right. And then there was just a case from the uh, Eighth Circuit 
which awarded nominal damages to uh, students at the University of Iowa for that uh, business um, leaders in Christ yep. uh, fiasco they and, had up there. And that was actually a, a, a pretty big deal because that goes back a few years to when, as similar with the uh, the Students for Life at you know, UNI, the business leaders in Christ were, were uh, had their their official club status revoked at, at University of Iowa, and uh, and they had already been an organization and they had their status revoked. Uh, the the the, organiza- the 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 Blink organization did sue the University of Iowa. They won, um, and then they also sued to to be allowed to to actually get. Uh, uh, monetary I- individual damages against the administrators who were who were responsible for it, for uh, having discriminated against them, having violated their rights, and so uh, the the Eighth Circuit did indeed just um, say that 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 they could be held liable for their actions, and that law was clear, and, and that those that those students did have their rights violated, and and because of that were uh, were eligible to sue for nominal damages. Okay. So now these uh, two bills uh, that are now, uh, comb- I guess, uh, divided, uh, the House File 744, I guess, is the main one. Uh, yep. where, where does that bill stand right now, um, and uh, what does it have to go through yet to become law? Sure. So, so House File 744, and the other one is House File 802 for anybody who wants to look at that, that race and sex stereotyping training. Um, so, so those two bills have actually made it through uh, Senate Education subcommittees. We, we held those subcommittees, um, let's see, on the 23rd, which was yesterday. We held those subcommittees yesterday. They passed out of those subcommittees. Uh, the House File 744 actually passed out unanimously. All three members of the subcommittee support it. Um, the, the House File 802 is a little more, is a little more um, controversial. It, it does go into those, to those trainings for, for uh, teachers and staff, but it also goes into trainings, into diversity trainings that, that for all of, of state government, for all government organ, governmental organizations, and so it's gotten a little more it's gotten a little more um, traction for, from the opposition. Uh, both both have been held through subcommittee, and they are on the agenda for the uh, education committee next Tuesday. I believe is when our committee will be held, and so those those bills will move through committee next Tuesday. Um, there may be changes to both because the the House files that were sent back to us were not exactly what what we had sent to them and so we need to find some compromise we need to find some common ground on how we move those forward but uh, i have every expectation that both of those bills will be deba- debated on in the senate floor and eventually make their way to the governor's desk very good um now if somebody clear, wants to uh, chime in on these issues uh, send um, information to their legislature legislator about it uh, where do they go to do that yeah so so if you want to uh t- to reach out to your uh, senator or your representative, you can go to the legis.iowa.gov website. That's L-E-G-I-S dot I-O-W-A dot G-O-V. And you can find a place where, you, where in, the, in the drop-down menu, you can, you can go to the, where it says find your legislator, and you can, you can uh, type in your zip code or whatever at your address, and it'll get you to who your legislators are. And right there, you can click on their email addresses and send them a message on, on your support for these issues. Uh, additionally, you can um, you can follow what's happening with the bills. Uh, there's there's a there's a quick link uh, box where you can type in HF744 or HF HF802, and you can and you can look over there to, uh, on the on the left side of the screen that will pop up. You can find the activity that's taken place on both of those bills. Okay. Now, where does the opposition seem to be coming from on either of these bills? Um, so right now, there, there's very little opposition to, to House File 744. Um, it really is just a defense of First Amendment rights. It, uh, it creates some, some level of accountability. And, and honestly, I think that's the, the thing that's, that's the problem. You know, the reason we have these high-profile issues at our universities is because there's no accountability mechanism for people who do violate someone else's rights. And so it, it creates some accountability, uh, disciplinary uh, action, um, through for, for for professors or teachers who violate students' rights, and so I, I think getting that accountability into place, no one's opposed to. No one believes that, that students' rights should be violated, and so um, there's some training involved in that, and there's the accountability piece. And and truly, House File 744 has very little opposition at this point. Uh, House File 802 does indeed have more opposition, and the opposition is is that. Uh, it, you know, there's a lot of, of mandatory trainings that are going on within schools and universities and, and governmental organizations surrounding uh, race and sex stereotyping. 
and, and it only gives one side of the, the picture and it and it, it paints entire races and, and sexes and, and groups of people. It paints them in a broad brush that, that frankly is, is, is just a violation of, of everything that, that we would hold dear as, as Americans. You know, there is no group of people who are all bad or who are all good. Um, but the opposition feels like this, uh, this is, um, I've, I've been called racist, I've been called um, um, uh, homophobic, anti-LGBTQ. It couldn't be further from the truth. The reality of it is we just don't believe that that we can, with a broad brush, paint any single group of, of people as as good or bad. At its very core, that is anti-American. It is racist to do that. And 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 so the opposition is is saying that uh, the exact opposite of the intent of of House File 802. But there are some places that probably need to be to be tweaked, just because. Um, it is a very broad bill, and, and, uh, and we want to make sure that there are no adverse unintended consequences. So we're taking a good hard look at it before we run it through committee next week as far as how we might need to, to tweak that to make sure that, that we're not stifling free speech in the process, and that's important. Now you'll be the floor manager of that bill when it comes out, correct? I will be, yep. Uh, both, both bills, I'm currently the floor manager of those bills. Um, we do have some, some great supporters of both of those bills on, on, uh, in caucus, and, and so um, I'm sure that I will not be the only one speaking, but, but procedurally I'll be managing that through the, through the process. Does this uh, have any effect on, on what we know now as a 1619 program? Um, so not directly as far as as far as i read the bill it has no direct implications on the 1619 project um it, it does get at the heart of 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 saying that you know implicit bias and 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 there are underlying biases that we all have it, it doesn't matter who um but it does get at, at, at that underlying factor of that stereotyping and scapegoating um, and so um, I'm not familiar enough with the 1619 project to say whether or not it would be uh, affected by by the language that's in this bill per se, particularly not once we get it amended. Um, but it but it does disallow, uh, you know, just just off off in whole calling an entire race or or an entire gender or an entire sex. It off the cuff says that can't happen any longer. So I suppose uh, if the 1619 project does that, those parts of the 1619 project could not be um, taught as a mandatory part of, of training. Okay. And uh, are you hearing anything from the universities themselves, the professors, the uh, committees there, the students of, about these bills? Yep, certainly. Um, and, and from both sides of, of the conversation, I, I will say the, the, the Senate file that was originally the, the impetus for this whole conversation, I actually sat down with the, uh, the attorneys for the Board of Regents to make sure that what we were doing didn't violate anyone's due process rights, because that's important as well, because there are the penalties in there. We wanted to make sure that it, it would be functionable through, through the process of the Board of Regents and the independent governance of each of the universities. So I actually worked with the Board of Regents to get the initial language in place so that we could make sure that, that it wasn't, wasn't going to be subject to a lawsuit so that it was enforceable and all of the things that it needs to, that, that it needs to be. So, so the, the Board of Regents, the universities as a whole, have had a part in this conversation. Um, I have, and frankly, students reaching out is part of why uh, is part of the prompting of the bills in, in the first place. In each of the three university situations that I mentioned before, I had students who were harmed by this behavior reaching out to me, asking me, begging me to do something, begging me to protect them and support them in this process. Now, I'm sure if, these, uh, if this bill or both these bills get through the legislature, uh, my guess is the governor will sign them. I, I have no reason to believe that she wouldn't. Um, okay. Neither of these bills, uh, again, we're, we're working at protecting people's rights, not violating people's rights. We're working at, at uh, making Iowa a great place to, to participate in robust dialogue. Um, I, I think the best part of America is that, is that we're subjected to voices that aren't necessarily exactly like ours. Um, I, I loosely quote General Patton often when I say, if everybody's th thinking the same thing, somebody isn't thinking. And I, and I believe that wholeheartedly. I want to hear opposing opinions. I want to hear things that challenge me and what I believe. And so for me, uh, I have every belief that the governor will sign this because I believe she, she agrees with that. I believe she uh, would, would 
echo what I'm saying in that uh, what makes Iowa and America stronger is the diversity of ideas and the ability to share and debate those ideas. And so I have no reason to believe that she wouldn't support it. Gina? I think you guys covered it well. I, I'm glad to see that this uh, bill is in progress and that um, we can um, watch to see what teeth it has when it, when it lands on the governor's desk. Very good. Senator, I want to thank you for joining us today. We certainly appreciate it. Appreciate your time. I know you have to get back uh, to your legislative work right now, but uh, we do appreciate your, uh, your time with us, and uh, we'll keep in contact over this. Thanks so much. It's been my absolute pleasure. As you might have noticed from the tone of my voice, this is one of the issues that rise to the top of, of, of the things I truly care about. We gathered that. Thank you. Senator Amy Sinclair, Republican from Allerton, Iowa, Chairman of the Senate Education Committee, thank you very much again for joining us today. And you're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio, and Gina and I will be right back after these messages. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Catholic Women Now provided in part by Permar Security, providing security solutions for homes and businesses since 1953. Permar Security is a Catholic-owned family business supplying security systems, access control systems, video surveillance, fire alarm systems, and video doorbells. All alarm systems are monitored out of their monitoring center located in the state of Iowa. Permar Security, 515-244-5660, permarsecurity.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Dowling Catholic Sports is provided in part by Ashworth Vision Clinic. With two licensed optometrists, Barbara Sheets, a Dowling graduate, and Dr. Craig Harper, the Ashworth Vision Clinic team provides complete eye exams, contact lenses, glasses, glaucoma testing, and pre- and post-operative care. Ashworth Vision Clinic is located at 60th and Ashworth in West Des Moines. 515-440-4610 or online, ashworthvision.com. Thank you, Dental Associates, for underwriting Dowling Catholic Sports 365. With over 40 years' experience, Dental Associates is a group dental practice with the mission of promoting optimum health and well-being to all patients, providing preventative, restorative, and cosmetic dentistry for the entire family. Message underwritten by Dr. Kenton Gleichman, Dr. Steve Carbaca, and Dr. Ben Nagel. Dental Associates, addressing your smile, needs, and dreams. Online at Des Moines-DentalAssociates.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and John Leonetti in the morning is provided by Five Sons Naturescapes. Five Sons Naturescapes is a Catholic veteran-owned family company providing premium outdoor landscaping, clean up and restore outdoor living space with retaining walls, privacy fencing, pergolas, paver sidewalks, and patios. Issues with soil settling and water around the foundation and yard? Five Sons Naturescapes can grade and install drainage tile to help. Five Sons Naturescapes online at fivesonsnaturescapes.com. What is the best gift ever? Giving a Catholic education is at the top of my list. Your contribution to CTO helps families send their children to our Catholic schools who otherwise could not afford it. In giving to CTO, you receive the best tax credits ever. Pledge or donate online at ctoiowa.org. The bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Storm Alert Weather is provided by Divine Treasures. Divine Treasures is a Catholic book and gift store serving the Des Moines community for over 25 years. Their mission is to help Catholics know, love, and keep their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and His Church. Divine Treasures is where you can find great Catholic books, beautiful Bibles, rosaries, jewelry, statues, and religious gifts for those memorable events in your life. Divine Treasures, 5701 Hickman Road, Des Moines, 515-255-5230. Thank you to Divine Treasures for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio. And we're back. You're listening to Faith on Trial on Iowa Catholic Radio. Gina, uh, topical show uh, Very. on on the rights of uh, of uh, students and professors to free speech and free religion on college campuses. That's right. And I think I'm very proud of being an Iowan. Mm-hmm. It sounds like we're ahead of the, the mark in um, structuring our Board of Regents and our legislation to support the students and their free speech rights, especially when it comes to matters of faith. Um, I, d- and it also sounds like we're in good hands with the ADF taking the oh, case up to the Supreme Court. They, yes. Those guys know Americans what they're doing. Americans Defending right? Freedom yes. mm-hmm. is just an amazing organization, what they do for um, 
people of faith and, and all Americans. But I'll tell you today, I learned something that has troubled me when we do this show. It, not a month goes by without another university a story about a student's rights, uh, First Amendment rights and freedom of speech on campus being um, uh, needing to be defended. Mm-hmm. And I don't understand, I've never understood why the universities, after these cases have been decided, uh, continue to um, a- allow this activity on their campuses. But today that question was answered. And well, the, uh, the business are- leaders uh, in Christ is a perfect example of that because they were already told by a district court, federal district court judge, you can't do this. And then they turned around and did it again. That's the basic story there. And um, and so that's one of the reasons why I think uh, the A Circuit decided they're going to uh, well, it sounds take like the immunity away. Depending on how the next Supreme Court ruling comes out, we may have some teeth and individuals will be able to be sued under these rulings. And I think that may be what is happening. And that, that will is what is happening. change things, I think. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're pretty much out of time right now, so let's uh, uh, finish off here with our prayer to St. Michael. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening. Join us next week for another edition of Faith on Trial. Till then, have a blessed and peaceful week. Our freedom of conscience and religion is being challenged by laws and regulations imposed by secular society. Faith on Trial with Defender of the Faith, Deacon Mike Mano. Faith on Trial, Thursdays at 10 a.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio, iowacatholicradio.com, and the Iowa Catholic Radio app. Support for Faith on Trial and Iowa Catholic Radio provided in part by Imogene Ingredients.